it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Brian Wilson from the University Health Network Biophotonics in uh, Canada, who will be discussing how biophotonics can help in the fight against disease, and I suspect he'll talk about quite a few other things as well. Please. Thank you. It's my honour to uh, represent the biophotonics community here and tell you, uh, at least in a snapshot, uh, something about this area. If I could have the uh, PowerPoint, please. Uh, so I'm going to talk about biophotonics. Uh, which is the convergence between optical sciences and life sciences. Uh, it has a long history, but it's perhaps taken on its own identity, uh, uh, mostly in the last 20 years. And what I want to do is give you a uh, snapshot looking at different aspects of this subject. So if we start with what are the potential bioimpacts of biophotonics? Uh, first of all, tools for biodiscovery. Sorry, I didn't mean to go back. Uh, tools for biodiscovery, uh, one example here is being able to image gene expression during embryonic development. Uh, in current medical applications, we have examples like colonoscopy to detect early colon cancer, laser surgery, the type of uh, treatment of uh, Port Weinstein and birthmarks that you heard about this morning. So these are in the categories of analytic techniques, diagnostic techniques, and therapeutic techniques. Uh, perhaps more uh, for the future are uh, the, the potential impacts of photonic technologies on some of the grand challenges in medicine and also on uh, tackling some of the problems in global health. Just a note on global health, of course we think of photonic global health as light-enabled healthcare technologies, but it's also important to recognize that there are many other factors that feed into human health, and we've heard about some of them at this meeting. Uh, so I think uh, photonics, biophotonics, is part of this uh, whole spectrum of activities for improving human health. And I'll come back to this. I just listed here some of the grand challenges in medicine uh, where photonics, biophotonics, could have further impact, and it ranges from disease prevention, regenerative medicine, personalized medicine, point of care delivery, et cetera. So a large number of different areas of high importance, high potential impact in medicine where photonics could play a role. I can't obviously in the time available go through all of these, although there are very interesting examples in each of them. So let me just take uh, one of them, which is point of care delivery and telemedicine. In other words, taking these technologies to the field, to the village, to the community, and using them in a remote way. A couple of examples here, one from our own lab, uh, where we're using cell phone, standard cell phone based technology, in this case in fluorescence imaging mode, in order to identify bacteria on chronically infected wounds. And here you see a patient, this is looking at the foot, this red fluorescence here are bacteria. The critical medical procedure here is to clean that up to debride it and to remove all of the bacteria. This is not visible by normal light. However, you can see it in fluorescence and you can substantially improve the ability of the nurse or the physician to clean that wound. Another example is, and we've touched on this fortunately uh, in, in the last talk, is the use of similar consumer technologies in other areas of point of care. Here's an example of the use of Google Glasses for, for uh, uh, diagnostics. Each of these are examples of technology transfer. In this case, technology transfer from the consumer sector to the medical sector. And that leads me to ask the question, what is it that actually drives biophotonics? And I think there are three main things that drive this field. Obviously, trying to meet end user needs. We have a medical problem or a biological uh, question, can we use photonics to address that? Uh, but equally importantly, enabling components that come from other areas of the photonics industry, consumer, telecom, military, and convergence with other established sciences and technologies, from molecular to nano to imaging to informatics, et cetera. So let me just uh, exemplify uh, technology transfer. So here's an example 
of technology transfer from military to medical. Uh, in this case, the use of very, very high sensitivity imaging devices used initially for uh, night goggle vision, being translated directly into tracking the flow of lymph in the lymph lymphatic system of a patient after surgery to see if the lymphatic system has been compromised. Here's an example of technology transfer from telecom into the medical domain. And the example is of optical coherence tomography, which in many ways is the optical analog of high frequency ultrasound imaging. Uh, this uses optical telecom components directly and widely as the enabling technology. This type of optical imaging is already standard in ophthalmology for imaging the retina at very, very high resolution to diagnose retinal disease and also to track uh, changes in the retina with treatment. And here is an example in cardiology where what you're looking at here is actually a fly through in real time through a human coronary artery in a live patient. And so using this fiber optics that comes directly from telecom, one is able to look inside the coronary artery of a patient and actually make high resolution dynamic images of the structure and function of that coronary artery. Here's examples of convergence. I've included four here. This is a complicated slide, so I won't go through it in detail, but just examples of convergence between nanotechnology and biophotonics. This is a lab and a chip device developed by a colleague in Singapore for detecting virus. Here is work from our own lab on converging conventional radiological imaging with endoscopy, optical imaging, where we're using combining real endoscopy and virtual endoscopy to guide a surgical procedure. And here you see in real time the radiological images, the visual image, and the computed combination of these two so that the surgeon knows exactly what he wants to remove based on the pre-treatment planning that he obtained from the radiological imaging. Here's an example of the combination of robotics and biophotonics where fluorescence imaging is now used as part of robotic surgery commercially. And here in the more fundamental uh, uh, aspect is combination of a convergence of molecular biology and biophotonics, which is exemplified perhaps best by the discovery, which was awarded the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, of fluorescent proteins, which can be used to label cells through their gene expression and to be able then to follow biological processes. And just perhaps one example of this, uh, this is a, uh, an example not just of uh, fluorescent proteins but of other types of fluorescence probes where what you're looking at is actually a real-time imaging of brain function as the subject, in this case a mouse, is eating. And so you can use this sort of technology, combination of molecular biology and optical imaging in order to actually track in real time the dynamics of neurological processes as a subject, an animal, or a patient carry out some function. Obviously, a breakthrough technology in terms of trying to understand the function of the human brain. And then ask a more fundamental question. Why is it that biophotonics is so useful for biological applications? And there are a number of reasons to do with the fact that optical energies are molecular energies, to do with the optical wavelengths, to do with the fact that there are many, many interactions that you can exploit between light and molecules, and of course, the other practical aspects. So just to illustrate a couple of these, uh, here is Raman spectroscopy, vibrational spectroscopy, 1930 Nobel Prize uh, in, in physics. 80 years later, is being used to guide brain tumor surgery. Looking at the molecular signature of the tissue using the phenomenon which Raman described in 1930. It's not surprising 
that since the optical domain has wavelengths which are comparable to cellular structures, that optical microscopy is ubiquitous in modern biology. And we heard yesterday that the uh, latest Nobel Prize last year in chemistry was for the invention of super resolution microscopy, microscopic imaging, optical microscopic imaging at sub wavelength resolution. It's going to be revolutionary in terms of basic biology. We know that light is generally safe, and here's an example where light is used, transmitted across the brain of a premature infant in order to monitor non-invasively the oxygen status to see if the infant is getting into trouble. And of course, the fact that we have the ability to ultra-miniaturize, as we just heard, optical technologies means that you open up a whole spectrum of options for new medical devices. And if you look at these properties of light and why it's so useful, it's useful because it's relevant, you have high sensitivity and specificity, you have easy adoption and dissemination, and you have a multiplicity of functions are possible. I want to give a couple of examples of barriers that biophotonics can help, help overcome in healthcare. And the barriers you can identify range from uh, sorry, scientific through clinical all the way through cultural. And I'll take the one example where uh, the problem that is being uh, overcome is a combination of a clinical problem, which is to detect early cervical cancer, a socioeconomic problem, because this is not an inexpensive technology in order to uh, uh, disseminate widely, and a cultural problem because of women's fear of examination in this procedure. This is not only a problem for the Western world, it's a huge problem for parts of the developing world. So that, for example, these are the figures for cervical cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, which are essentially 10 times the rate as in the Western world. And so this uh, quotation from WHO, the cervical cancer is an avoidable cause of death among women in sub-Saharan Africa. Now the question is, technologically, how are we going to solve that problem? And I'm indebted to my colleague at Duke University for sending me this slide in which they have developed a tampon-based colposcope. In other words, a colposcope in the form of a tampon which the woman inserts herself. It takes an image which is as good as the image which, that you get with a conventional colposcope and you can then telemetrically send that image to the doctor, he doesn't have to be in a local region, and get a diagnosis. Uh, again, this should be a game-changing technology. A second example is uh, tackling perhaps not so much cultural, but socioeconomic and geographic. And my colleague, Vandali Vagnato, who's in the audience, has uh, been instrumental in setting up in Brazil over 100 centers for the use of light-activated drugs, photodynamic therapy for treatment of cancer, uh, obviously addressing the tyranny of distance in Brazil, uh, plus in an affordable way providing uh, uh, technology to solve and tackle a major health problem. This is a slide, you may not be able to read it, uh, which celebrates the Nobel Prize in Medicine to Neil Swinson in 1903. One of the very first Nobel Prizes ever in medicine uh, was actually for biophotonics. Uh, what Swinson did in his clinic in Denmark was using either natural sunlight or technology. This is the arc lamp, a carbon arc lamp from a lighthouse. Uh, using this technology, available at the time, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his use of light for treating skin diseases. Now jump forward 100 years, and this I've just taken from some Canadian sources, you see that biophotonics represents somewhere between 10, 15, 20, 25 percent of the total photonics industry. Uh, and so it represents something like a $100 billion uh, market. And you then ask the question, why has this taken so long? Why is there a 110-year interval between Finson and what we do, do today? And I think why now is really because two things have happened independently and synchronously. 
One is the emergence of photonics, which we've been talking about for the last day and a half, the technology and the science of, of, of light. And the other, which is less obvious to this audience, I think, is the emergence of molecular bioscience. So if you look, this has almost been synchronous in the last 20 or 30 years. We've had the rise of photonics, we've had the rise of molecular bioscience. Will this continue in the future? I believe so, and I want to finish by just showing two examples of why I think this will continue. And I'll take those examples deliberately from what I call extreme by, uh, photonics in the first place. So one example is attosecond science, the use of light pulses, laser pulses, which are a billionth of a billionth of a second. You think that's a long way from biological applications. However, it's not because those light pulses are so short that you can effectively freeze atoms in place in the molecule. And that allows you a new window, a new opportunity for understanding the structure of proteins for which you cannot make crystals. And the inability to make crystals of proteins is actually a major impediment to drug discovery. So if this concept of using attosecond pulses to do structural protein, protein structure in non-crystal form uh, uh, actually uh, comes about, then it will have major impact on healthcare. And the last example I give you is, if you like, extreme bio, but using relatively simple photonics. And the extreme bio I'll give you is optogenetics, where one can now implant genes of choice into any part of the brain. When the genes are implanted in that part, you can then use light as a switch to turn on and off neurological function. So you use light to turn on neurological function or you use it to turn it off. And an example is from the recent literature is this case. This is, image, this is looking at the neurological function switched on by light in the brain in a region which is believed to be linked with autism. Now, this is tremendously exciting in terms of being able to understand brain function and the possibility of treating brain disease. Clearly, an area like this, as it evolves, is going to introduce huge spiritual, moral, and ethical dilemmas. Are we going to ultimately achieve the goal of controlling the, the, the brain? Is that a desirable thing to do? Do we want to do that? But it's clear that the technology is going to take us there and so, like so many other things in science, we are going to have to tackle the ethical dilemma that's posed by it. So let me finish. I hope I've given you a peek through the curtain into the future of biophotonics based on where we are at the moment. Uh, for those of you who do not speak French well, like myself, this says, you ain't seen nothing yet. And I think that's true. And I think the year of photonics, or the year of light, that we're celebrating here will actually become a global century for biophotonics. And with that, I'd like to thank UNESCO and the International Review of Light for inviting me. And I'd also like to thank uh, my colleagues around the world to provide the material that I've used to illustrate the subject of biophotonics. Thank you.